Hello! Welcome to Musing Heavy, the website devoted to alternative reflections on hard rock and heavy metal. My name is Stephen Meyer, and this is part three of a series based on my essay entitled Collecting Heavy Music in a World of Streaming. All right? And what I'm doing in this series is I'm trying to outline some of the pitfalls associated with streaming. Some of the issues that I think haven't been well understood, but I think could become increasingly important as we go forward, even though streaming has become the pop, the most popular way that people consume music, I still think there's certain advantages associated with maintaining physical product collections, such as having a CD collection or a vinyl collection, et cetera. So that's sort of what I'm doing in this, in this series. I'm not trying to convert people back away from streaming towards, say, uh, physical product, just trying to outline some of the issues that are occurring. In this particular part three, I'm going to, I think, attack head on what I believe is perhaps the biggest problem associated with streaming. And I think that has to do with the fact that it's, it's rendering the value of music almost down to zero, right? I think that's a big problem. Um, so I'm going to provide a few examples, crunch a few numbers for you again, and, and, and show you where I, what I, why I think this pitfall of streaming is going to become such a problem. All right. Share the old screen. So here we are, about halfway through the essay, actually. So streaming is distorting the value of music. So here's perhaps a truism uh, when it comes to commodities and et cetera. If you want something, you normally have to pay for it, right? In terms of commodities, if you like. And if you're willing to pay for something, it will normally have value. Now, I think that's how we used to approach music, the purchase of music, right? If we wanted music, we understood we normally will have to pay for music, right? And if we're willing to pay for music, then we will put value on it, right? But I, unfortunately, I think that's becoming increasingly yesterday's model. I don't think we see music the same way now as we did before. In fact, I think music's becoming valueless, right? Okay, let's move forward on that. We'll put this into a little bit of a different context. We'll personalize this a little bit. Okay, I have many musical heroes, right? But I have to say, I've never met any of my all-time favorites, right? I've just never been, I've gone to lots of shows, but I've never been the guy sort of to wait outside after the concert and get autographs and stuff. It's cool if you do. I totally, I think, I understand why people do that. It just was never me, right? But let's say, say if that ever was to happen, if I was to meet one of my musical hero, heroes, I'm sure I would mention how much their music has meant to me or essentially how much value I put on their art. Maybe I wouldn't say it in those terms, but that's certainly what I would be talking about, right? Let's take the example of the mighty rush, okay? Uh, I, I currently possess 30 distinct rush titles on CD. Some of these are multi-CD packages, actually. And I've got a few DVDs as well, okay? Although in terms of true purchases of rush music, this, this number is actually far greater. It's actually way more than 30 uh, because uh, originally I had the Rush catalog on vinyl. Then I replaced it on CD. Then I replaced those CDs with remastered CDs. And then lately I've replaced a lot or added those CDs with um, the anniversary editions that have come out. So the deluxe sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I was estimating, I sort of crunched the numbers a little bit and I figured, you know what? I've easily bought at least $1,000 worth of Rush music, maybe a little more, but we'll, we'll say $1,000, right? Okay, now I don't know if that seems like a lot of money or not, and that's just for the music, right? So I'm not talking about, you know, the, the, the what I've seen Rush live quite a, I saw Rush live, I got to talk about the past tense, that's still hard to get used to, but I saw Rush live uh, several times, so I'm not talking about the prices for concert tickets, or t-shirts or stuff like that, just strictly the music, okay? So I probably have spent $1,000 or, or a little more, right? However, the point I'm, I'm making at this juncture, in comparison to the enjoyment I derived from listening to Rush, this $1,000 investment seems like one of the best deals I've ever made, right? It's the best $1,000 I think I've ever spent, right? 
for me personally, and I'm sure there's other Rush fans that could probably talk about this the same way. There's no vacation I've ever taken, no car I've ever purchased, no home furnishing item that I've bought, and even stereo uh, equipment upgrades, which sometimes are a big deal to me. None of this, none of this has brought me as much entertainment as listening to a Rush album. It's not even close, actually, right? When I'm talking about all the purchases I've ever made, so I'm not talking about, you know, the, the value I put upon friendships and stuff like that. I'm talking about purely purchases. There's nothing I've ever bought in my life that I've enjoyed more than listening to over and over Hemispheres or 2112 or, or Signals or On It Goes, right? Not even close, right? Perhaps the satisfaction gained from playing Rush Records is rivaled only by my overall satisfaction from, say, being a homeowner. That's the only thing I could even compare it to. And I would say that's not even on par with it, right? But but let's face it, $1,000 for Rush albums and CDs, et cetera, right? And the enjoyment I got from it, well, I paid a whole lot more than $1,000 for my house, right? And, and, and everything else I've had to do with it, right? So again, you can see where I'm talking about. It's the best deal I ever made, right? Okay, so am I a little geekish about Rush? Yeah, probably. And by the way, I could say the same thing about my other favorites like Black Sabbath, Purple, Alice, Slayer On It Goes, right? Kind of say the same thing. So am I a little geekish? Yeah, probably a little bit. But I'm sure there are many other heavy fans out there that would echo comparable sentiments, right? I, I'm not alone there. I know it, right? I know there's lots of people who would say the same thing. Nothing tops the enjoyment I get from listening to Rush or any of your other favorites, right? In fact, you might say that given the high value that fanatics put on the Rush listening experience, right, vis-a-vis -vis the purchase price of their albums, right, given what you actually had to pay for the albums and given how much enjoyment you derive from it, in a weird way, we effectively have been ripping Rush off for years. When you, when you say what we had to pay and given how much enjoyment we, we derive from it, we've been ripping these guys off for years. Right. So should I ever meet Getty Lee or Alex Lifeson, for that matter, he might find it amusing if I actually apologized for this indiscretion and the fact that I'm only partially joking. Right. Maybe I still owe Getty Lee a whole lot of money. If, if, if this were a perfect world, if I had to pay in proportion to my enjoyment, I've been ripping Rush off like like a bandit for years. Right. I mean, kind of a silly way to think of it. But really that that, you know. From a utility perspective, some sort of a cost benefit perspective, I think that's completely accurate, right? Okay, regardless though of this massive imbalance between what I've paid for the music of Rush and the enjoyment I've derived, I still retain a sense of value from owning the physical product that contains the music, okay? The $1,000 investments in Rush Records on CD, and then I had them on vinyl at one point, as I said, it's tangible to me. And it's always felt completely natural that I should have to pay for this enjoyment. Even when I was a kid, I was in the Rush very early. And I would be calculating as I'm delivering my papers on my paper route. Okay, next time I get paid for my paper route, I should be able to afford Caressa Steel in 2112, right? So that's I'm thinking about this stuff, right? And when I actually bought the albums, that had value. That was tangible. Still does to this day, right? When I buy a Rush CD or any other CD, that $22 that has value to me. I can't buy, I can't afford to buy every CD, so I have to make choices. And the ones I buy, that has value. That Because I pay that money and get that physical product, there's value there. It's, it's tangible. Okay? All right. It, and again, it feels completely natural that I should pay for this enjoyment. Right? It, it feels like a great deal to me. Right? Always has as a kid, still does today. The amount of enjoyment I get from, this, from, this, from buying this music, right, way outweighs what I got to pay. Okay. I think you get the point here. But how does this compare to renting Rush songs via streaming? Your mind thinks completely different when you're streaming, I believe, right? Okay, we're gonna look at a couple of scenarios here to get where I'm, to talk about where I'm going here. Take the example of someone who subscribes to Tidal's premium service. And the reason why some people subscribe to Tidal is because you get the highest quality and fidelity. You get at least CD quality, if not better. So, so audiophiles will, will uh, often subscribe to title, 
Okay. So let's say you're, you're, you're going all out and you're going for the highest, the highest quality streaming you can find. And that would probably be title. So if you do that, this will cost you about $20 a month or about $240 a year. Okay. Yet as, as is the appeal of this medium, it's not just rush tunes that you're getting, but millions of other titles, right? Or perhaps thousands of titles that are relevant to your interests. Okay. So I prepared a little scenario here that we'll go through. Um, so let's say again, you're, you're subscribing to title, you want the highest fidelity, you're gonna pay $240 a year. Okay, so how much, let's look at the title here, is Rush Music valueless when you're streaming? How much per song is it actually costing you in the streaming world, right? As we're gonna see, almost every scenario leads us to effectively zero. And if something costs you zero, you have a tendency not to value it, right? So you'll kind of, that's where I'm going with this. But let's, let's crunch the numbers here and see if you kind of buy this. So let's say we got all choices. So how much persona are we talking about here? So you're paying $240 a year, all right? So that's kind of, at this point, that's sort of, that's sort of fixed. There are 170 Rush songs you could stream. Yeah, I counted them. There actually are. So not counting covers, et cetera. There are 170 original Rush songs, right? Okay. And plus a million other songs, right? So 240. So if you're trying to calculate, you know, per song, it would be what you're paying divided by the number of songs, right? Okay. So you're, you're, um, you're paying 240 a year. You're dividing that by 170 Rush songs plus millions of other songs that you can, you can stream, right? Because it's not just Rush available to you. It's all kinds of stuff, right? So that works out to, say, in the neighborhood of decimal 00024 per song or about a thousandth of a penny per song, right? Or essentially zero, right? So it really rounds to zero. So if you're streaming Rush and all kinds of other stuff, you're essentially paying nothing per song. Right. That's what it works out, because because, again, if you do the rounding, that's how it will work out. But you might argue, OK, I get that I have millions of songs I could stream. But the reality is I'm only interested in specific types of music. And sure, I get that. Right. You don't maybe care about country and jazz and all the other possibilities. You're, you're only interested in maybe just hard rock and heavy metal. Well, let's be even more directed than that. Let's say you're a fan of just heavy prog. Right. So it's, it's bands that are sort of in the same orbit as Rush, for instance. Right. OK. So how do the numbers work there? OK. So you're still paying your two hundred and forty dollars a year for title. You're 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 able to stream your hundred and seventy Rush songs. But then say you get another ten thousand other songs that are heavy prog. And in reality, that number, I'm sure, is much larger. OK. I mean, ten thousand other songs of heavy prog. If, if, if you look at it that maybe, say, a band has 100 songs, well, that's, that's only 100 other bands, right? So there's at least 100 other heavy prog bands out there. But we'll, we'll keep, again, all the numbers I'm working with are they're modest estimates that in reality, the cost per song is actually even lower than what, what I'm demonstrating. But let's say there's 10,000 other songs you might be interested in that are heavy prog. Okay. So again, if you want to know what would that be uh, per song, it's 240 divided by your 170 Rush songs plus 10,000 other songs that might be kind of like what Rush plays, right? Okay, so that works out to about $0.0234 per song or essentially two cents a song, right? Or in an album, let's say on a, a given album, you, you might have on average 10 songs. So maybe you're paying 20 cents an album, okay? Again, that might as well be zero to us, right? If on your credit card bill, you see a charge for two cents or 20 cents, you're not even gonna look at that. That's like that's like irrelevant to you. It's just, it's a rounding error, right? That has no value. That's like change just falling out of your pocket that I don't even know if I'll bother to pick that up, right? So yeah, two cents a song or even 20 cents an album, it might as well be zero, okay, in terms of value, right? Okay, let's consider one more scenario of, say, a title subscriber. Now, I would argue this person would be really, really rare. But we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it anyway because it is a possibility. Let's say there's that person out there that only streams Rush and nothing else. Okay, they're, they're focused on Rush 24-7. It's sort of like if you're a grateful dead, a dead head and all you listen to is the dead. Well, I'm sure there's people out there that all they listen to is Rush, right? I don't think there's that many, but they'd be out there. But honestly, though, uh, the Rush heads 
I'm sure they have all the physical product. I doubt they're streaming. I, well, they might be streaming, but they got the physical product too. But let's say there's that rare bird that streams, only streams, doesn't buy physical product, and they only stream Rush. Okay, how do the numbers work out there? So it's 240 a year for title divided by your 170 Rush songs. Okay, here, is, this is the one scenario for streaming where Rush songs would still have some value, monetary value. OK, because that works out to about a dollar, a uh, dollar 40 per song or say for an entire album, it's probably about 14 dollars an album. Right. That 14 dollar that actually works out kind of cool, because if you were to buy a, a, a Rush CD, right, not not say an expanded one, but just a standard Rush CD, say Fly By Night or Moving Pictures or whatever, probably would cost you 14 or 15 dollars an album. So it kind of works out. It's kind of neat. Right. Um, but this would be the one scenario where Rush music would still have value, at least in terms of how we used to view value in music, right? But I would argue this would be an exceptionally rare person. Not many people are going to look at it that way. If they're streaming, they're streaming with, with the rationale to have access to all kinds of other music, not just Rush. And if you only care about Rush, I would argue you're probably not streaming. You probably have all the albums and CDs, et cetera, right? Okay. And then, of course, we have to say that's only for title, right? That's only for or any type of streaming platform that you're actually paying for. We know nowadays the vast majority of people download the free app and they stream for free via Spotify or Amazon or YouTube or et cetera, right? So in any scenario, Rush fan or whatever, however, whatever your motivations are for streaming, you're paying essentially nothing per song. Music is valueless, right? And it's valueless whether you're paying for the streaming service or not. The only scenario would be is if you're that rare bird that only listens to one band, then okay, it still has value. But you so, so you probably see where I'm going with this, right? We're we've entered a world where that for the vast majority of streamers, Music has no value, right? Or as Kenny Lee sings in the spirit of radio, bearing a gift beyond price, almost free, right? Of course, Neil wrote the lyrics to that, right? But it's funny, I, I'm, I'm sure they weren't anticipating streaming, but even at that point, Rush was sort of talking about the value of music. It's, it's such a great thing. Uh, it bears a gift that's almost beyond price, it's almost free. Well, in fact, it is free now, right? I mean, for the, if you're streaming, effectively, music has become free. So the point is that the digital transfer of music via downloads and most significantly through streaming has rendered music almost costless, right? To the consumer, right? When, and here's the problem. When something has no cost, there is a tendency for people to view that product as valueless and take the thing or the service for granted. That's where we are now. Is it any wonder that many music fans today actually resent having to pay for music? Our, our brains are being re-hardwired, if you like, in terms of music. People just think it should be free because it is essentially free if you're streaming, right? So people are they're, they're changing their whole approach to music. Why pay for something that appears to have no monetary value? Why would I pay for this? Right? It's like paying for the air. Why, why would it, it's free? Why would I pay for this? Right? But on the other hand, people who have physical product, right? Physical product not only rewards the artist in comparatively more lucrative terms. See part two on this, where I do crunch the numbers for you on that if you're interested, right? So physical product, buying CDs, buying vinyl, rewards the artist much more, much better than streaming ever will, right? But it constantly reminds us music fans that music has to be manufactured, okay? And manufacturing incurs real cost, right? When I have that CD, I get it. When I'm listening to the fine Zero and Below album, the new release by Crowbar, beautiful, heavy sludge band out of New Orleans. Love, love Crowbar, right? So as one many of uh, many examples, when I'm holding the CD in my hands and I'm reading the liner notes, it's completely transparent to me that the $22.99 I paid for this physical package 
is reimbursing band leader Kirk Weinstein and the rest of Crowbar for their efforts. I get that. That connection is very real to me. It reinforces the inescapable truth that if I want similar types of creations to continue, some form of compensation is needed, right? If I want more music from Crowbar or all bands that play like them, I got to pay for it. There's value here. The music has value. When I, when I have that CD, I get it. The link is, is clear and blatant, right? Yet if songs from zero and below are streamed, it becomes far easier to lose this crucial link because the amount the consumer is paying for this particular album is effectively zero, just like we just outlined for Rush, right? That album in the wider scheme of things costs you nothing. But when I buy it on CD, I get it. It's costing me something. With streaming, it becomes tremendously easy to forget that Weinstein didn't produce the album for free, that he's not a charity, he's a working musician, okay? Of course, those who craft music are also rewarded by the satisfaction of accomplishment, right? They're, they're artists, right? And the appreciation of their audience. I'm sure that's a, still a trip for them when their audience really well received, that their new album is well received, for instance. I'm sure that's, that's, there's a lot of gratitude there, right? Right. However, let's be honest here. Satisfaction and appreciation does not pay for musical equipment, for studio time, for producers, for session musicians, on and on it, on it goes, or even just for survival. Musicians need to eat. They need to shelter. They need to buy clothes. They need to care for their families and on and on it goes. Right. OK, so the erosion of music as a viable economic commodity is probably not a grave concern to the heavy music giants, right? Or indeed the most popular artists in any genre, right? So Metallica, Iron Maiden, ACDC, Aerosmith, Kiss, Guns N' Roses, and, and the like, right? They've made their fortunes, largely when people were buying physical product, I might add, right? But they've made their fortunes. And they're going to continue to draw substantially on the tour circuit as well, right? And also due to just massive, massive volumes, they're even going to do okay with streaming. They're not going to make nearly as much as they did when most people bought vinyl and CDs, but they're going to do okay with streaming because we're talking about billions of streams, right? If you're at the very top, okay? But the majority of hard rock and heavy metal acts still active today must be driven principally by non-monetary artistic motivations and or hope that significant portions of their fan base attend their live shows and buy tangible merchandise, right? I mean, that's got to be it. Unless you're, you know, at, at, at Metallica or just a little bit below, right? Why are you motivated to keep going as a musician, right? Well, it must be you're not doing it for money. You're doing it because you're an artist and you just got to get that stuff out there or you're truly driven by your audience, right? Or, and or you're hoping that your audience will still buy some merch to keep you alive, right? They'll buy some shirts and, and, and they'll come to your concerts and stuff like that, right? Otherwise, why would you carry on in this world a value-killing server-based digital music transfer? Where's the incentive, right? Um, now, here's the thing. If you're a fan of more obscure music, right, heavy or otherwise, this should give you some pause for thought. This should worry you, actually. Worries me, right? So far, we've been lucky in the heavy community, right? Many excellent musicians living at the fringe, right, that they're not mainstream, still deliver incredibly good material, right? I'm actually astonished that that's still happening, right? I, I keep buying new releases from, from a lot of you know, more extreme metal bands, for instance, and they continue to knock it out of the park. They continue to be amazing. And I'm actually surprised we're still getting as much as we're getting, right? Because with so few commercial incentives available, how long will this continue, right? It's, like, it, it, it's, it's just like any other thing when we talk about creative, creative people and innovations, et cetera. If you're not getting paid for being creative, there's going to be less and less people who will be creative, right? And that's, I think, where we are with music. For me, it would be a sad day if new music came primarily from the volume-oriented, watered-down mainstream performers, right? That would be a very sad thing. I think if something does not revolutionize the current streaming model, which doesn't, which really doesn't work for artists at the end of the day, 
I think the music environment will inevitably deteriorate into increasing homogeneity, right? So again, like I say, so far we've been lucky, but I don't know how much longer this can go on. And again, at the heart of it, I think is because society values music as basically zero, right? And I think that's a problem we're only going to beginning to see as time goes forward. Okay. So that was part three. In part four of this series, and I hope you'll join me for that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more. So, so in more, the, the first couple parts, I guess I've been talking about some of the pitfalls associated with streaming. Uh, that was sort of the emphasis, I guess. In part four, I'm going to talk more about, uh, I would argue, the continuing advantages of maintaining physical collections, right? Not just that it's better for the artist, because I because it is, but I think it, it, it's a cool hobby for people to have. So so again, it might get into the because a lot of people might say, well, what this dinosaur this dinosaur guy Steve is talking about? He still still buys CDs. Why is he doing that? Well, I'm going to give you a little insight as to why I keep doing that. Why why I'm driven to keep doing that? And while I Believe I'm not alone there. I think there's lots of other people that do it too. So I hope you'll join me for part four. Anyway, have a great day and all the best to you. Take care.